Welcome everyone. We'll give it a few more minutes for people to, to jump on and get through the waiting room. Okay. All right, we'll get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Courtney Worrell. I'm the president of the Waterfront Alliance, and we're really excited to have you with us today to talk about the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, verification, and the uh, and the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. This is one of many webinars that we do on the Wedge program, and we're just really thrilled to be joined by the Department of Design and Construction. Um, I will uh, I will uh, introduce all, all of our speakers today. First, we have with us Commissioner Thomas Foley, who's the, uh, the Commissioner of DDC. We are joined by Q Ameri, who's De Deputy Director of Design and Community Engagement for the Coastal Resilience Program at the department. We're joined by Sophia Duberbuehler Yafar, who's D Program Director for Design in the Infrastructure Division. And we're joined by Eric Ilovic, who is the Deputy Director of Coastal Resiliency at the department. And we are also joined by Joseph Sukawi, who leads the wedge, wedge program for the Waterfront Alliance and is our Chief Waterfront Design Officer. So just a little bit about the Waterfront Alliance before we get started. Our mission is to inspire and affect resilient, revitalized and accessible coastlines for all communities. We're working on that and we have been for 15 years overlaid by the challenges of climate change and the climate crisis that we'll be facing in the future of extreme weather, which is a, much of the focus of today as well in terms of our response to that. And just a little bit more about us in terms of our programs and what we do. We are one of the leading educators in the region on all things having to do with coastlines, waterfronts, and the harbor. We have a conference every May. We do several webinars and meetings just like this. We're also an advocate for public access for communities, communities who are still cut off from the waterfront and have been for decades um, in, our, in, in our transition from our post-industrial, uh, uh, the post-industrial landscape to what should be a modern world-class waterfront. We are the, we take credit for the Fiber Row Ferry Service in New York City, which was part of our major advocacy platform, which Mayor de Blasio took up in the first um, months of his new administration. And we also do a lot of work with students and bringing environmental education to all the waterfronts and coastlines around New York City and New Jersey. We're an advocate for climate resilient policy and legislation as well, as well as the WEDGE program. So in the next slide, I believe I'm going to be turning it over to Joseph, who will uh, lead the rest of the discussion. Take it over, Joseph. Thanks, Courtney, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm excited to, to share with you a little bit about the WEDGE program before we turn things over to DDC to talk through the actual design of, of ESCR. I'll give a little bit of context on the WEDGE program what it is, and then how ESCR earned um, the, the points that got it to wedge verification. So wedge is a, is a rating system that's looking at waterfront design. And if we can go back to that, that last slide for just a second, David, we're, we're looking at three primary principles in wedge. There's, there's resilience, there's ecology, and there's access. In any waterfront site, we wanna see all of these things coming together because those are the things that are going to serve uh, a neighborhood. So you're looking at, at this is Brooklyn Bridge Park on the on the slide now. You've got this combination of factors that make this a, a fantastic public space. You've got maritime access. You've got resilience that's protecting the the neighborhood surrounding it. You've got different ecological features, and those are what the wedge system is rating. You can go to the next slide now. So at its heart. Wedge is a rating system. You might be familiar with LEED or Envision or Wells, some of the other systems that are out there. Wedge is specific for waterfront development because there's so many unique complications of building on the waterfront, unique things around coastal risk that you have to bring in and, and risk reduction and flood concerns. Um, access to the water is, is, is something that we pay a lot of attention to. So Wedge was really developed to 
provide both guidance and um, a set of standards for what does good waterfront development actually look like. The way that Wedge works is that we have six categories. Each of these categories have a series of credits in them that have both design strategies of here's what we've seen work on great waterfront projects, and then scoring performance metrics that are actual targets that we're looking for projects to hit. If they hit those performance metrics, they earn points. Anything over the threshold of 115 points across the system earns wedge verification. ESCR earned uh, 120.5 across that threshold, uh, which is why it earned the, the wedge verification. Next slide. ESCR joins um, currently 10 other sites across the country that uh, have been wedge verified. A lot of these are going to be familiar to, to folks in New York as some of the flagship sites around the city. So we've already seen Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, Hunters Point South, which there's a, a few pictures of in, in this deck. Um, Hunters Point South is one of those, Domino Sugar, um, and then there's a few industrial sites. There's there's Sims Recycling, Oak Point, McKinnis Cement, Sandy Hook Pilots Association. Wedge is really set up to serve more than just kind of the public park spaces, though it's a really great fit for the, these resilience and park space projects. Um, we serve all kinds of different land uses. ESCR is the 11th site to have been been verified. There's another eight that are currently in the in the pipeline. And what that means is that we're currently doing a technical review of those different sites. Um, and how the wedge verification itself actually works is that the, the, the property owner, which in this case is the city of New York, submits their, their design and their, their construction documents you know, the, all of the plans for the site, they submit those to Waterfront Alliance, and then we bring in a set of technical experts. In this case, um, with, with this project, it was two civil engineers, uh, a, a flood modeling expert, and an environmental professional who are not connected to the project in any way. And with Waterfront Alliance, we they pour over all of those site plans and see, does this align with the wedge standards that are documented in the manual? Do they hit those performance metrics? So it's a really rigorous process. Um, and we're, we're really excited that that ESCR um, pursued that process and, and came out um, as one of the one of the very rare wedge verified sites. You can go to the next slide. To, to give you a sense of kind of where wedge came from and how wedge was developed, wedge is about um, about eight years old. Um, and when it was created, Waterfront Alliance brought in more than 150 different experts from advocacy groups, neighborhood groups, government officials, the, the design field and engineering fields, planners, environmental professionals, all kinds of disciplines to figure out and lay out what actually makes a great waterfront site. What do we want to see happen on, on our waterfronts? We and, Waterfront Alliance doesn't weigh in on kind of the land use side, what's, what's actually going to be built on the site, but we're looking at the features that can be built in across all types of land use. And that's why you see that there's some residential sites, there's some industrial, and then like ESCR, there's a, there's a park site. Anytime that we have any updates of the, of the process, including we're going through a revision now, we bring in technical advisory committees and other, other professionals um, who are going to help us ensure that Wedge continues to be evidence-based and science-based, that we reflect the best practices of the field, and that the, the standards that we are, we are asking for are really pushing the envelope and asking projects to go above and beyond what just construction code or, or local, state, or federal regulations are asking for. The, the projects that earn wedge verification are really those that are going above and beyond. Next slide. So I want to walk through just um, very quickly, like what are the actual credits that um, the, the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Program um, earned points in. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. We'll just go ca category by category, starting with site assessment and planning and where they actually earned points across the system. Next slide. So in site assessment and planning, um, this is where we're, we're measuring kind of the due diligence and upfront 
um, work that a project does to ensure that they have a base to build a great design. So we were looking at things like they, they had a multidisciplinary design team. They assessed the different ecological contexts and, and climate vulnerabilities, community engagements measured here, and then management of the site and maintenance of the site and whether there's a plan in place for that. And I will point out that you know for these credits, they didn't necessarily earn full points across all of them, but but these were the things that at least in some fashion were present on the on the project in, that in a way that met um, at least partially some of the wedge standards. You can go to the next slide. So responsible siting and coastal risk reduction. This is where flood resilience um, from coastal storm surge comes in. Um, and this project earned a number of points in avoiding and reducing risk from coastal hazards. It's cited with ecological sensitivity. They, they cited in design structures to improve visual and other sensory connections to the water. Um, and then the, there was um, a really significant amount of emergency preparedness and response planning built into, into this site as well. You can go to the next si slide. Community access and connections. This, this credit's looking at kind of the public space features of the site. Um, and here the, the project earned points around providing quality public access areas on the waterfront, increasing waterfront pathway and greenway connectivity, providing diverse programming and passive educational features. There were, there were a number of those on this site. Um, and then increasing transportation access to the water. This is a, this is a, a site with two ferry stops, ample transit access and earn points for that as well. You can go to the next slide, edge resilience. So edge, edge resilience is really looking at kind of what are you doing on the waterfront edge itself? Um, the, the, the site here, you know, chose an appropriate edge strategy is kind of what we, how we term what they're, what they're doing along the waterfront. It fits the context of the site. It fits the flood resilience goals. You can go to the next slide, which is natural resources. And then this, this natural resources credit in, is looking at things like biodiversity and ecosystem services and, and how they are connecting ecosystems, how they're supporting habitat complexity and biodiversity in the park made some really great strides here. It's also redevelopment and cleanup of contaminated sites, which is happening on this project, reducing water use, um, managing stormwater quantity, and then practicing environmentally responsible construction, all strengths of this, of this project. And then finally, the last slide on, on innovation. Um, this is where the, the, the reviewers have some criteria where they're able to reward projects that do one of two things. So either that are doing inventive design, which would be the, the things that fit this resilience, ecology, and access goals of wedge that we don't actually have a way to measure well in the standard. So there's a few kind of um, innovation points available for that. And for, for this particular project, the integration of coastal risk reduction, storm surge risk reduction techniques, and the stormwater techniques on the other side, they went above and beyond and really were innovative about how do we measure a, and plan for storm scenarios where you're having coastal storm, storm surge during a precipitation event. And that's not often how projects plan, but is actually the scenario that's most common and is it has the most impact on how a site's protecting neighborhoods and um, so that was a, a very innovative approach and one that that our reviewers were really intrigued and really excited that they were doing and then the other place in innovation where they can earn additional points is exemplary performance so wedge is already asking projects to go well above and beyond what what design code or construction code or, or regulations are asking for for the projects that really hit one of our credits and just knock it out of the park, um, they can earn a, a few additional points. And they did that in two areas here, one of which was emergency response planning. The complexity of this, uh, of the, the emergency response for this site with the, the floodgates and the flood walls is really complex. And they did a, a fantastic job really planning for that. And then they also earned for coastal hazard risk reduction, given how many, um, residents is 110,000 residents um, are protected by this project from, um, from a storm event. Um, so they earned ex um, exemplary performance credits there. So that gives you kind of the overview of what Wedge is looking at, what Wedge saw in this particular project. Wedge is a very kind of 
quantified and, and transparent process. You know, our, our performance metrics are are available in the Wedge Manual, and then our our reviewers look look at the design, look at those standards, and assess where did they meet the performance metrics. So I wanted to give that overview of here's what the, the those reviewers saw. I'll transition it at this point to Commissioner Foley, who can introduce the the, the project in a little more more depth. Um, and share some of the great work that DDC did here. So Commissioner, take it away. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Joseph. Um, we're delighted to uh, partner, obviously, with the Waterfront Alliance, <clears throat> and we're delighted with our wedge uh, verification. Uh, go to the next slide. So what we'll be hearing about today is a bit of an overview as far as uh, DDC. I'll keep that short and sweet so that we can concentrate on our sustainable infrastructure. Sophia will give a highlight on that. Our Q will give an overview of our coastal resiliency portfolio, which is expanding, um, ever expanding and ever in need for it, certainly in this uh, dynamic and beautiful city. Um, and then Eric will give an overview of our east side coastal resiliency, uh, specifically the, the design and construction, where we are, uh, where we're going. Um, and it really is uh, an amazing and beautiful uh, uh, project there. So next slide. Uh, okay, go to the next one, the next one, everybody knows who I am, well, at least you knew now and probably don't need to know much about me, but um, but who we are, I think it's very, very important for the, the for everybody to know who DDC, who we are, what we do, we have an amazing team of over uh, 1150 professionals. We are the engineers and the architects for New York. Um, our projects really uh, encompass throughout the five boroughs. Um, it really be, be forms the fabric and the backbone of the city. Um, we don't like the headlines, um, but I do believe we really build amazing, cool stuff throughout the city. Um, we um, were at the service of over 8 million New Yorkers. Um, <clears throat> and we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to deliver our projects expeditiously um our projects um they are they are not worth anything if they remain literally um a set of drawings on a design table they have to be built they have to be built expeditiously on budget and on schedule uh functional beautiful this is what our expectations are so just as a quick you know you see on your top on the top left here is our queen's garage and community center this is the, the, the agency's, the city's first design build project, $82 million. This will be substantially complete the end of next month. Um, in 22 months, this project was designed and built. Um, and it's quite stunning. Uh, green roof, LEED certified, solar panels, 25,000 square foot community space. Uh, we're actually taking a tour out there next week with the end user. Um, and so we, we're looking for the tools in order to be successful to deliver for New Yorkers quicker. Uh, bottom left is our 40, new 40th precinct uh, designed by Big uh, up, in the, up in the Bronx. Uh, we have our series of infrastructure projects, uh, obviously throughout the city. Um, and then we always, um, we always rise to the occasion when it comes to addressing emergency conditions. We certainly did that during the pandemic with building out temporary hospitals, um, two temporary hospitals in 11 days, three permanent health care facilities in six months, $130 million design and construction, um, built out temporary health labs, um, three of those actually in record time. So it's amazing. I always say it's amazing what engineers and architects can do when, um, when we're given the money and people get out of our way. Um, and that's our mantra and will continue to be mine um, as we treat each and every day as an emergency here in New York. Uh, next slide. So there's a lot of information here, um, but I think the main thing is, is that we're we're currently managing projects over twenty four billion dollars, one of the largest public works uh, agencies in the in the country. Um, we do work with twenty eight sponsor agencies, everything from uh, corrections, transportations to police, fire, um, cultural institutions. Um, we build out cat condos, raccoon lodges, and everything in between. Um, and that's why we have such an amazing and dynamic team um, because of the interesting work that we do and that we deliver for New York. Um, and, but we need to do better. And in order to do better, we need to have the tools in order to be successful. 
So one of the things that we're really striving for is to have that, to, to get that innovation, the collaboration from the industry, the partnerships. Um, and that's why we'll be spearheading some um, recommendations and changes um, in the next sessions up in Albany for um, the legislative priorities that we have um, as part of the city's uh, goal to really streamline procurement, get things done quicker, um, or as the mayor says, GSD. Um, and that's uh, certainly in line with what we want and what, what's expected. Um, and the reason for that is because we have such a, an amazing growing portfolio. Um, we've had relatively sustained portfolio, portfolio of over a billion dollars a year with a capital, capital budget. Uh, this is without one dollar of federal money. Now, where each each and every year now will be will be exceeding four billion dollars of capital improvements. And so, what does that mean? That means that we need a lot of help. We need help up in Albany, but we also need help with those that are participating in the in the um, with this in our conference here today with our partners at Waterfront Alliance. We're going to need help with our resiliency portfolio, with our with our design team, with our contractors. Um, and then um, there'll be a lot of things that we're going to be managing, but we're going to be partnering and looking for this um, to to be able to uh, to obviously plan, build uh, better uh, in the years ahead. Uh, next slide. Um, so what what did we do? So one of the one of the priorities that I had when I was named uh, when I was appointed by the by the mayor in January. Uh, hard to believe 11 months ago, um, was um, was basically to revisit our the capital process, um, partner with the industry, partner with City Hall um, to really give us the tools that we need to succeed. Um, and you can see here, this is a picture of our Queens garage. Um, I, I strongly recommend that uh, for those that haven't seen it to, to you know, certainly go onto our website, nyc.gov, DDC, uh, strategic uh, the blueprint 2022 um and it is uh it's actually quite a, a good read um it's a bit better than Tolstoy's war and peace I think it'll keep everybody interested during the holidays um but it is it, well done in-house um yes engineers and architects can write and uh and I think there's some great amazing visuals here as well um but it really tells a story it tells a story as far as uh, we have very thick skin we know what needs to be uh what we need to improve upon. Um, but we're also looking for, again, it always comes back to partnerships with the industry, partnerships with our professional design and engineering firms, our contractors, our subs and trades, um, in order to, um, to listen, um, to see what needs to be improved upon. Um, so that's why we put in uh, incentives into our contracts for early completion. We put value engineering on all of our upcoming projects. And one of the things that Joseph had indicated for our you know, verification was the innovation. Innovation does not stop at design completion. Innovation and collaboration are needed and required and expected on every DDC project from design start until construction completion. And one of the things that we're seeing because we have such an amazing team and you'll, you'll certainly hear from them today is the value engineering components at Eastside Coastal Resiliency um, of us sitting down with our designers and the buildings literally at a round table and saying, what changes can be made in order to move the project forward? This is a new world. This was designed pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. What can we do? Can we look at precast sections? Um, how can we handle some of the, you know, deliveries and, you know, and, and structurally rehabilitate piers and things like that so we can get barge, you know, um, some of our material delivery and things like that. So um, again, the innovation doesn't stop at, at design completion. It continues. Uh, we're also looking at um, registered contingency on all of our projects. So all this is incorporated into the blueprint. Um, and as far as some of the things that we're able to do, which I highlighted during the pandemic, um, we're actually still doing it on some emergency projects, both at, both at Rikers and at Hart Island and at other locations, a number of infrastructure projects as well. Um, and then we're, uh, we're able to, as always, rise to the occasion because a lot of the bureaucracies are kicked off to the table because we're working under an emergency deck. But I, I firmly believe that this should be our everyday business practice. Um, and that's my goal as commissioner um, because I, I lead an amazing team. Um, my job is to clear the bureaucracy away for them and let them shine as they always do. So speaking of superstars, I'm gonna introduce our first one here. Sophia, if you will take it over and give us um, the, an, an, an update on the sustainability. Sure, thank you, thank you Commissioner. Um, 
Good morning, my name is Sophia Zuberbuehler. I'm the program director for the Sustainable Infrastructure Unit at DDC. Next. Thank you. Um, just to give you a quick overview of the Sustainable Infrastructure Program, we were um, created a couple of years ago, and I'm excited. It aligns with the blueprint where we're integrating sustainable infrastructure in our division. Um, so the unit itself, we support um, our colleagues here in implementing sustainable, resilient, equitable design. We help create tools. We host workshops. We actually do training also with the Institute um, for Sustainable Infrastructure. They have an EMVSP training, and we help um, um, most recently, we've created a sustainability task force where we're looking at our sponsor agency's projects, and we have a collaborative conversation to see how our uh, sponsors' projects can include um, actual indicators, right, to make sure that we have a successful and sustainable project to make sure that we're doing the project right. Next. So next couple of slides, just to show that um, we do not own any pro um assets as the commissioner explained, but we are tasked with making sure that we design and we build it correctly. So we're definitely aligning with the many city initiatives that exist, including one, one NYC, and I know that's getting updated now by the mayor's office, next, and a couple of other different initiatives that are there. So um, we are usually invited to the table to have a collaborative conversation with the different city agencies, DOT, um, mayor's office of um, resiliency, um, you know, even um, parks department to make sure that we do the right projects. So it's good that we're in the conversations and we're able to have um, a more streamlined um, impact on how to make projects more um, resilient. Next. So um, I'm sure in this slide, um, so DDC infrastructure has many different typologies, but um, We've condensed them into a few different ones to see how we can approach our sustainable and resilient um, impact and uh, use our framework and our tools into these um, different, these 10 typologies here. And the one that we're going to be talking about today is one of the coastal resiliency ones. Next. So the Envision framework, I'm not sure if any of you, uh, if you're aware with it, uh, of it, but um, just give you a high level overview. It's what we're using as the framework to, to um, influence how our design projects are moving forward. So it aligns well with WEDGE. So that's why we were super excited that WEDGE was being used on the East Coast Resiliency Project. So just a quick overview here is uh, the five categories. And then the next slide. It talks about the Waterfront Alliance, which Joseph already talked about. So um, it's exciting um, when we learned about Wedge that it's kind of like a, it uses a lot of the, um, the text about Envision, but it's nice because it's just for waterfront projects, which New York City has a lot of. Next. So here it's nice to show that there is a synergy between both of these. So um, Starlight Park also um, got a Wedge Award back in 2017 and it got an Envision Award in 2021. So it's nice to see the side-by-side -side comparisons of the different um, categories and how it excelled. And I believe this was an earlier version of Wedge um, that was used on Starlight. I see Joseph nodding, yes. <laughs> and then the next one shows the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project where um, they were both just certified this year as well. So it's exciting to see how um, there is another um, certification out there that's specific to the typology, which is great and definitely impacts us um, as New Yorkers. And um, my colleague, I think is going to speak about a cue about the different types of different um, um, projects that we have in our coastal project. But the next slide, please. Um, when we went through the wedge manual to see um, how it aligns with Envision and to keep streamlining the process, um, you know, of when our consultants use it, we were um, we did a side by side comparison, right, of how the different credits of um, Envision and Wedge align, just to make sure that we make our our process of even application and um, filling out all the different cover sheets and credit sheets more streamlined. So the next slide. We just went through the different categories also of it just to see how can we elevate, you know, the impact and what we're working towards here in a sustainable infrastructure unit is to make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel right and always using the lessons learned to make each project even more successful. Next one please. And, uh, you know, it's exciting because Wedge is unique to the waterfront. So there's a couple of credits that are just unique to waterfront design, and we look forward to seeing how this can be applied to future projects. 
And now um, my colleague Q is gonna talk about the Coastal Resiliency Project program. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here and giving us this opportunity. This is really an exciting project for all of us. It's been here for, with our agency for years and we're really excited to see it come to fruition and, and see the construction coming along um, nicely now. My name is Q Amiri. Uh, I'm with the Department of Design and Construction uh, within the Coastal Resiliency Unit. I handle design and community engagements uh, for our Coastal Resiliency portfolio. Next slide, please. So just a quick overview. I'll just take a few minutes and then hand it off to uh, uh, my colleague, Esker. Uh, I'm sorry, not Esker, Eric, who's gonna jump in uh, in more details uh, about the Esker project. But our unit, uh, we have a very small intimate unit that was formed uh, shortly after Sandy, um, clearly with the need of having a more focus, uh, focus on uh, resiliency and coastal protection. So DDC formed the unit that we have right now and slowly we sort of grew up to about 10 or 11 team members right now that we have uh, five projects in our portfolio, starting with the Eastside Coastal, You'll see up on top on this list, uh, we have Brooklyn Bridge, Montgomery, BMCR. And if any of you have any experience with government projects, you know that we have our own dictionary of acronyms here. So those are the orange highlights here, ESCR, BMCR, uh, the Red Hook Coastal Resiliency in Red Hook. Uh, it's the edge of uh, in, in Red Hook neighborhood, in the Red Hook neighborhood of Brooklyn. That's, uh, we call that a, uh, RHCR. And also Bellevue Campus, that's uh, the upper end of uh, the east, east Side Coastal Project on the east side of Manhattan. Uh, and we also have a flyover bridge that hasn't been designated an acronym just yet, but that's sort of a pedestrian um, cyclist bridge that connects the two uh, sections of the uh, East Side Coastal uh, Project that I'll show you in a minute in, the, in another slide. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a quick info card just to download high level um, information before Eric jumps in here. But uh, the Eastside project, uh, we were awarded about 340, a little less than $340 million from HUD, CDB, GDR um, funds, and the rest of that $1.1 billion was a, a local city match uh, on city capital funds. There's a little typo there that says 1.1 million, that's, that's my, my bad. Uh, we'll correct that in the future, but it is 1.1 billion uh, provided by the city funds. Uh, the stretch of the project is about two and a half uh, mile, 2.4 mile stretch on the east side of Manhattan. It goes from Montgomery Street down in the Lower East Side, all the way up to 23rd Street, a little past 23rd, 24th Street. And it includes the East River Park, as you can see highlighted here uh, in the yellow section. And the Northern part of it uh, covers Stuyvesant Cove Park, um, in that sort of pinkish uh, red section on the on the right side of the graphic, the flyover bridge uh, connects these two uh, highlighted uh, boxes, these highlighted sections, uh, and provides access from the northern end of the East uh, East River. I'm sorry, the northern northern end of East Side Coastal Project to East River Park. That's historically a, a pinch point that uh, community uh, folks have always had issues uh, with. Um, accessing and, and getting one from one end to another running or biking. So that became a separate capital project on its own as a commitment by the city to the community. And for construction purposes, we uh, had to break up the project into three separate packages. The project area one yellow box that you see here on the left side of the graphic, that's that entails the entire East River Park and um, some of the streets, side streets down in the Lower East Side the second package became Project Area 2 that includes Astro Levy Playground, Stuyvesant Cove Park, and Murphy Brothers Playground. And the third package is the Peril Conveyance, that's uh, essentially the sewer um, upgrade, the drainage uh, system upgrades that we have spread out through the whole project footprint. And those are highlighted in those red uh, intersections and red lines. The height of the uh, protection system ranges, the, the, the flood wall itself uh, varies between buried flood wall uh, and exposed and the portions that are exposed, it varies all the way up to eight to nine feet, about, uh, about eight to nine feet above uh, existing grade. And um, we started our design in 2014, the conceptual and planning phase uh, was kicked off back then and design phase sort of took about 
uh, almost six years uh, up until 2019. Once we finalized the design, we went into uh, procurement and pre-construction and our construction phase just kicked off about a couple of years ago uh, with a, a commitment to finalizing uh, construction by the end of 2026. Um, happy to take on questions at the end, but I'm gonna hand off here to my colleague, Eric, uh, and he'll walk us through more details on how the design correlated with a lot of the wedge and envision credits that we, that we uh, went through. Next slide please, and Eric, it's all yours. Thanks, Q. Hi, good morning, everyone. Eric Ilyevich, I'm the Deputy Director of Design for Coastal Resiliency here at DDC. Happy to share with you some information in a crash course of Eastside Coastal Resiliency. I think I only have about 20 minutes or less to do that. So here we go. Next slide, please. Um, uh, we can go into the next slide as well. So um, the origin story for the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project uh, begins just over 10 years ago in October of 2022, after the devastating impact of Superstorm Sandy. Um, there were 44 deaths and billions of dollars in damages, uh, including major destruction to all of our coastal areas. As you may know, there are over 500 miles of coastline in New York City, and this unprecedented storm impacted neighborhoods, roads, utilities, you name it, transit. Um, and also plunging Lower Manhattan into darkness for weeks afterward. So in December of that same year, uh, the city convened the Special Initiative for Re um, Rebuilding and Resiliency, or SIRR, to address the creation of a more resilient New York City. And the following year, a report was produced, A Stronger, More Resilient New York, um, which established the foundation on which our coastal flood protection projects were built. Um, and in, specifically within the coastal protection chapter, and specifically Initiative 21, which is titled Install an Integrated Flood Protection System in Lower Manhattan, including the Lower East Side. So around the same time, um, HUD launched the Rebuild by Design competition, or RBD, and one of the goals of that um, effort was to promote innovation, as Tom mentioned, innovation by developing regionally scalable and locally contextual solutions that increase resilience in the region. So using that framework that was established in the SIRR report, um, the BRK Ingalls Group, also known as BIG, BIG Architects, created, entered, and won the BIG U project, and U being the, the U shape of Lower Manhattan, um, and their name being BIG. So um, next slide, please. So the conceptual design included all of Lower Manhattan from the West 57th Street to the East 42nd Streets, but um, the first Ford uh, awarded was and is the Eastside Coast Resiliency Project or ESCR. And this is a, an overview of that project site. And as Q mentioned, from the South at Montgomery Street to the North to 25th Street, um, it's nearly a two and a half mile long span of integrated flood protection. Um, and you know this compartment, uh, I think Joseph even mentioned the, the number 110,000 residents, and then of which of that are 28,000 NYCHA public housing residents. And these are the, the, the neighborhoods of those NYCHA residences uh, in the different colored neighborhoods here. Uh, next slide. So the original goals of the project are, uh, are as follows, uh, to provide a reliable integrated flood protection system and minimize the use of closure structures and deployables and integrated in that the flood protection structure would be, again, integrated into the fabric of the neighborhood and landscape so that it wouldn't just be a stark wall blocking the waterfront from the upland. And a flood protection also means addressing upland drainage. Uh, and I'll describe how we do that coming up. Um, Another uh, goal is to improve waterfront open space and access um, to respond quickly to the urgent need for increased flood protection and resiliency and to achieve the implement implementation milestones um, for project funding allocations established by HUD. Um, and then also to note, uh, the project must apply for a LOMER or letter of map revision, which is an action required to change the firms or the flood insurance rate maps that's, all, that pro, that's a process also known as FEMA accreditation. So that you can see that the project has wedge guidelines pretty much baked into the overall project goals right from the start uh, and included in the, base of, the basis of design from the get-go. So um, now we can start to focus on the specific components of the project that were developed after many, many, many years of design, uh, as well as working extensively with the community and our operating agencies to provide um, protection from this, which is our design storm. 
On the left, you can see the project compartment uh, and the flood water in light blue, which is the 100 year FEMA firms floodplain. And this also includes sea level rise, which at the time of the conceptual phase was based on the New York Panel on Climate Change or NPCC 90th percentile projection for the 2050s, which is also the same as the 50th percentile average for the um, 2100s. And then on the right, uh, the design height that we uh, were using as our basis, you know, working from the bottom up, we have mean higher high water at just over two feet, NAVD 88. Um, the existing grade of the park and the esplanade is roughly at eight feet. So we add the 100 year floodplain and include freeboard and wave action, plus the 30 inches of sea level rise for contingency. And an extra six inches, we arrive at 16 and a half feet NAVD 88. Uh, and the design criteria based um, by the city also required an adaptability of up to two feet to 18 and a half feet uh, if and likely when uh, the city endures sea level rise in exceedance uh, of those current projections. So not only do the walls uh, need to, to stand up to this, but they also have to stand up to an additional two feet, uh, the foundations and walls as well, if the city would like to add on to it. Uh, next slide, please. So here is an overall view of the flood protection system itself, which consists of above grade or exposed flood wall, which is indicated in the black lines here, and below grade or buried flood wall in orange, which is below the raised East River Park, um, which also includes the Esplanade and the bulkhead as that front line of protection. Um, also indicated here in the numbers, there are 18 gates total. Uh, there are six roller gates, which are in the, the light blue and 12 swing, great swing gates, which are in the darker blue. Um, and as Q mentioned, there are drainage improvements, uh, which are indicated here. They're like these uh, arrows and blue lines, which are also known as the parallel conveyance, um, which include new combined sewer connections to deeper interceptor sewers um, and two nine feet diameter interceptor gates, which close off our compartment to manage our compartment sewer shed uh, and with the me mechanical equipment housed in the interceptor gates, um, which are buildings uh, located at the city right of way, it's at, at, at street level. Uh, next slide, please. This is an overview of Stuyvesant Cove Park, which extends from East 18th to East 23rd Street. Um, there was not enough width here to raise the park out of the floodplain, because um, this area is constrained by the raised FDR drive. Um, and the accessibility goals for the project would have resulted in a much longer pathway approaches here, which were again, were uh, we were constrained. There's an, an, an active parking lot underneath the overpass here um, and the surrounding roadway uh, and the FDR drive overpass. But this is the um, primarily the only section of the project that maintains the original spirit of that, um, the big U, the RBD project where the flood protection is actually woven into the above grade landscape. Um, and the, the berm here, which is strictly for landscaping and aesthetics and not an actual coastal levee, um, it does soften the harshness of just a gray concrete wall. Uh, and it does provide some wave action attenuation. Um, and while all of the park structures, the landscaping, the soil, the plantings and trees, they're chosen for resiliency, the park still remains uh, on the unprotected side of the flood protection. So we'll take a, a closer look specifically at East River Park um, to discover, uh, we'll talk about the differences in the two project areas. So next slide, please. So here's a cross section of East River Park, um, both existing conditions and the built condition. Um, the current condition looking from the right side, which is the East River, to the left, we have the Esplanade, we have all of the 55 acre park, it's ball fields, it's programmed areas, all five buildings, uh, including locker rooms, comfort stations, uh, and maintenance buildings. Uh, and then moving further inland, we have the FDR. And of course, we have of all the 110 residents in their neighborhoods and their buildings or homes uh, and all of that infrastructure are all still vulnerable to a coastal flood event. Um, and as I mentioned bef before, the original RBD concept, uh, even here in East River Park, looked more like the design in Sty Cove Park. Uh, and we were about to finalize this design, but Tom mentioned um, value engineering. We also did some constructability. Um, and after that exercise, uh, it yielded the final design, which actually raised the entire park out of the floodplain. It pushes that line of flood protection from the FDR side of the park out toward the bulkhead and toward the river. Uh, it raises all of those athletic uh, and program fields. 
um, as well as all the five buildings out of the 100 year floodplain. Uh, next slide. So the design team was conscious of the public, you know, if we're raising the park, we didn't want to, to keep the, the public away from the water's edge. So this is the toolkit of differing edge structures uh, and get downs to the East River. Uh, and they were selected where feasible along the entire edge of East River Park. Um, also to note, you know, the alignment of flood protection structure is indicated in that yellow bar here. Uh, and it, it meanders depending on where you are uh, in the park itself um, from a little from further outboard to further upland, uh, depending on the certain site conditions, um, which include, you know, the location of existing new and below grade infrastructure, sewer outfalls. Uh, Con Ed has a lot of uh, transmission lines are also known as oil statics. Um, the athletic fields uh, and then tree and deep rooting planting offsets. We couldn't have a flood wall with uh, next to trees that have deep roots that could uh, impact the flood protection or the seepage barrier below. So if we wanted trees further toward the esplanade or to the walk uh, to provide shade, uh, the flood, uh, the actual flood wall, the, the component that's doing the work for flood protection actually moves inland so we can provide shade uh, closer to the water's edge. Uh, next slide, please. So this gives you a rendering image of the uh, elevated parkland. This is at the Houston Street uh, intersection. This is an overall improvement. If any of you are familiar with the existing condition, as you enter East River Park from Houston Street, you cross uh, a very busy intersection. This is an off-ramp at uh, the FDR going onto, onto and off of Houston Street. But then as soon as you enter into the park, you hit a railing, uh, it's raised there, and you have to make a sharp right or left and continue down uh, a ramp to the park. Well, here we've actually raised the parkland up to that uh, overpass at Houston Street. Um, and this is the, the same image that started our, our presentation for the section on Eastside Coast Resiliency. So you're able to uh, walk right into the park. You see this meadow that leads out into the river. So this is a major improvement um, for access at this intersection. This also shows you one of the two embayments or one of the get downs uh, on the lower right section here. So we have seating uh, and an actual opportunity to get down closer to the water here. Uh, next slide. Um, this is showing you the concrete formwork um, and the wavelength distance of this uh, formwork was chosen uh, based on the public and its proximity uh, to and their actual speed or mode of uh, transportation in that condition, whether it's walking, um, which is a shorter wavelength, cycling, which is a little bit of extended and driving um, the maximum wavelength, um, and the, but maintaining a consistent frequency depending on how you're, uh, how you're the observer moving there. So um, this is one of the uh, items that we've uh, allocated to the innovation credit. Next slide, please. Uh, this again is one of our uh, 12 swing gates. Uh, this is actually located on the right uh, at the on-ramp to the FDR, uh, but this is just showing you a little bit closer up of uh, one of our swing gates. The Department of Transportation is identified as the operating and maintaining agency. They will be tasked with uh, maintaining and exercise these and then also deploying them uh, in the event of a coastal flood uh, event. Um, they have been, of course, one of our operating uh, partners and development of the emergency response plan. So they've been, again, along with us for the entire ride. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned, or as the uh, Joseph mentioned, the ONM and ERP are, uh, they're still in uh, draft form until we, until we complete the project because we have um, noticed some changes to the design, uh, as Tom mentioned, throughout construction. So that is a living document and we'll continue to, to develop that and finalize that through construction. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this is uh, showing you the improved waterfront uh, access. We are replacing three pedestrian bridge, Corlears Hook Bridge, Delancey Street Bridge and East 10th Street Bridge. I mentioned the improved uh, access at East Houston Street, the East 20th Street location. We are changing uh, a rather uh, awkward and cumbersome entrance to a parking lot into a, a, a much better pedestrian plaza. We're preserving the sight lines from East 20th Street out into the river there. Uh, 
um, so that are so this is an overview of some of the uh, improved access uh, items. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the existing condition on the lower left of the entrance at the Del Delancey Street uh, pedestrian bridge. As you can see, this is a chain link fence surrounding um, a very narrow pedestrian bridge. And then once you enter the park, you have to do a couple of switchbacks and then you're spilled out right into the shared use path where you have cyclists, bikes, et cetera. So the future condition on the right, we have a new pedestrian bridge, a little bit wider, uh, and it actually uh, spills out into the raised uh, area of East River Park where the shared use path is traveling underneath it. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, these are the three bridges that we are demolishing and replacing at Corlears Hook, Delancey Street, and East 10th Street. Next slide, please. And then uh, the existing condition in the park, again, is susceptible to coastal flooding events, saltwater inundation, uh, and salt spray. Uh, the primary species of trees right now in the park are London plane trees. They don't do so well with all of those conditions. Uh, we lost a lot during Sandy. So the planting palette that is uh, going to be planted is much more diverse. We have over 50 species of different trees, plants, shrubs, et cetera, et cetera. So we're excited to um, have an opportunity to provide a much more resilient landscape for future use. Next slide. One of the uh, innovations that uh, informed design are our buildings that are included in East River Park. These are two of the three um, Either the, the, the one on the left is the track house, which uh, houses some locker rooms and comfort stations. We also have two other comfort stations, but the uh, design of the uh, color array is the entire spectrum. Um, so as you're moving from uh, one side of the park to the other, the continuation of the spectrum is continued on for all of the buildings, um, which is not only attractive, but it could also help with wayfinding. Uh, next slide. And then the drainage improvements, again, not only are we stopping flood water from the coastal side, we are also addressing upland drainage. We are doing improvements to the system that is already there. We're doing these shortcuts from the shallower combined sewer overflow system to the much deeper interceptor sewers. We have those uh, in these light blue arrows, which are those new sewers that are those shortcuts from that shallower system to the deeper system. We are closing off our compartment by two interceptor gates at the, the north and the south side. Uh, and then we also have uh, the buildings that house the mechanical, mechanical equipment to run those large gates below grade. Uh, next slide. This is a cross section of the parallel conveyance uh, system. So the existing combined sewer overflow combines both stormwater and uh, wastewater. And in a normal uh, situation, the system can manage everything uh, that it's designed to. However, if there is rainfall in exceedance of the capacity, uh, there are outfalls that extend to the river, which are um, also managed by tide gates. So if everything can function properly, the system overflows, it goes out into the river and there are no backups in basements or street flooding. However, during a coastal flood event, those tidal gates closed and it would cause a backup. So in order to do that, if you can see on the lower left side, we have a shortcut in the system called the parallel conveyance, um, which shortcuts that combines to overflow to the deeper interceptor. Next slide. So this is just a, a walkthrough of a few images of the construction that we have to date. Next slide. Q mentioned already that we have uh, the two project areas uh, that are underway. All three of them are underway. Uh, and I'll show you some images of some of the construction to date. Next slide. This is the removal of the Delancey Street Bridge. Next slide. And this is the installation after the removal of the Corlears Hook Bridge. Um, we have an active ferry site at the Corlears Hook Landing. So we are maintaining access uh, as we do all of the work uh, around that area in East River Park by the, the New York City Ferry Landing. Next slide. This is just showing that we are doing um, some of the Esplanade work. We're doing it by barge where, where possible, which um, lowers the impact of truck trips. 
uh, in the city itself. Um, and we are doing also soil, soil stabilization in the park. We're bringing in a significant amount of fill. And in order for us to be able to construct a park, we can't, and in a short amount of time, we can't wait for that uh, fill to naturally settle. So we're doing some stable soil stabilization, some, some stone column work uh, in preparation for that new fill to be brought in. Next slide. Again, this is showing uh, some more of that storm, stone column work. Next slide. Uh, this is the Stuyvesant Cove Park. This is the foundation for the flood wall. Next slide. And actual that formwork that I mentioned, this is the formwork to actually pour the flood wall above grade. Next slide. This is again progress of the flood wall. This is um, the closure for the gate for one of the swing gates in Stuyvesant Cove Park around the intersection of 23rd Street. Next slide. And this is the other side of that gate location. And the formwork also does show the elevation of the flood protection. And we'll keep going. I know we're getting close to time here. This is the that same gate that is being installed earlier this year. And this is gate 18, which is at the northern terminus of our project. This is Astor Levy Playground and Bathhouse. This is where the northern end of the project actually ties into the existing VA flood wall. Um, and then that actually ties back to high ground uh, at uh, 25th Street and uh, First Avenue. This is also where we had a, a press event with the mayor uh, this summer where he actually, um, this is a, ro a roller gate, actually hit the button and a winch pulled this gate across. So um, we're happy to see progress here. Um, and you're welcome to go to Astro Levy and see this for yourself. The, pro the park is open uh, and you, you can check it out. I think that might be it. Next slide. Oh, okay, and this is that same Astro Levy playground. This is a resilient playground, resilient uh, structures, because this does remain on the unprotected side of the flood protection. Next slide. All right, I made it just under time. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you to Eric, Commissioner Foley, Sophia, uh, and Q at DDC for that presentation. This will be posted on Waterfront Alliance's YouTube channel. We look forward to answering any questions you have via email or, um, and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you.